Hi, and welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to take you on my journey in creating a large hydrogen alpha solar telescope. First, a disclaimer. While I describe in detail what I've done, and you're welcome to duplicate this or adjust it for your own objectives, note that I'm putting together different components that were not designed to work together. Neither Lunt nor Daystar recommends or endorses what I'm doing here. Just because my system works doesn't mean that if you try to do the same thing, it'll work for you as well. I'll cover more about this as the story unfolds. And of course, never point a telescope at the sun without the proper safeguards in place. Now with that out of the way, let's get on with the adventure. I have a 100 millimeter double stacked hydrogen alpha telescope from Lunt Solar Systems, and it's terrific. I've reviewed it on this channel before, and I recommend it. I've taken fantastic images with it. But just as a 100 millimeter scope can produce better images than a 50 millimeter scope, I noticed a few people with larger aperture scopes creating hydrogen alpha images that I just couldn't match for resolution and detail with my 100 millimeter scope. Lunt's next scope up from my model is the 130 MT. Similarly equipped, it's about $12,000. But I already own Tech 140 and a Tech 160 apochromatic refractors, so it seemed inefficient for me to add another 130 millimeter APO to my collection. My Tech 160 FL is an amazing high-end apochromatic refractor. It's been an incredible telescope on the moon, planets, and deep space targets. Using a Lunt 2-inch Herschel wedge, I took a photo of the sun that won an APOD last year with this telescope, and I've taken photos of plenty of deep space objects as well. I had seen on cloudy nights that someone had modified a 127 millimeter refractor to hydrogen alpha, and the renowned solar imager Simon Tang in California has converted a 150 millimeter scope in a similar manner. So could I convert my 160 millimeter tech to be hydrogen alpha as well? To look at the sun in hydrogen alpha, you need to have a special filter called an etalon. This is designed to block all wavelengths of incoming light except for hydrogen alpha, which is 656.28 nanometers, and its harmonics. Etalons are difficult to make and very expensive. There's three basic types. You've got a tilt-tune etalon, typically used at the objective of a small refractor, a pressure-tuned etalon, typically used in the middle of a medium to large size refractor, and a solid etalon, usually made of mica, that are typically used just before the eyepiece of a refractor. I go over all these designs in detail in my How to Buy a Solar Telescope video, so I won't repeat that detail here. A tilt-tune etalon over the objective wasn't practical for me as they're not made in the size I need. Separate pressure-tuned etalons are made to fit with a specific telescope, not whatever you might have lying around at home. So the remaining option was a solid etalon. There are two major suppliers of these products, Daystar with their Quark and other models and Solar Spectrum with their Suna and other models. I detail some of the differences in my how to buy a solar telescope video. The Solar Spectrum product was preferred by me but hopelessly backlogged and basically unavailable. So I decided on a Quark chromosphere. These have a reputation for what I'll call inconsistent performance. So I hunted around for a while before I found one that I was satisfied with. It includes a single etalon and a blocking filter. It also has a 4.3x telecentric, effectively turning my F7 refractor into an F30.1 system. The Quark is unable to safely receive unfiltered direct solar light from any objective larger than 100 millimeters. So I had to find what's called an energy rejection filter to fit over the objective. This rejects all wavelengths of light except about 610 to 680 nanometers so that the HA from the sun safely passes through, but all the other wavelengths, including UV and most of the IR, are rejected. This prevents the scope from heating up too much and consequent damage to the elements that I'm attaching. I had to measure the outside diameter of my dew cap and then order both the ERF itself, which is a disc of a special glass, and a custom cell to hold it, that would attach securely to my telescope. I bought it from Bader Planetarium and it took about 90 days to receive. I knew from my LUT 100MT that a double stacked image shows far more contrast and detail than a single stack one does. But how do I double stack my Quark? Daystar doesn't offer double stack systems. Instead, 
they offer a premium version with a tighter band pass, which does the same thing. For example, you could have 2.7 etalons in series, producing a similar result as a single 0.5 one. But a 0.5 angstrom quantum from Daystar costs $22,000 and has a six to eight month delivery. What could I do differently? Several others had combined a Quark or a Suna with a Lunt tilt etalon. I decided upon that approach, though I knew there was no guarantee it was going to work. So I bought a Lunt 40 millimeter HA dedicated telescope. I reviewed it here and it's a great little introductory scope for hydrogen alpha and I recommend it. I removed its tilt etalon and put it in a special RAF adapter, which is designed to fit in the telescope's image train. I'll put a link for the RF adapter in the notes. Then I removed the now unnecessary small internal ERF from the Lunt assembly so I can get a brighter image with less gain. It was time for first light. I had a slight panic attack when I could not focus on the sun at all, but after a while I figured out that if I added a 80 millimeter extender after the text focuser, I could see my first crisp images of the sun. I added a player one tilter after the Lunt Edelon to eliminate Newton rings, and then finally my imaging camera. Here's my high-end solar telescope. I'll start at the objective end. We have a Bader Planetarium 160 millimeter energy projection filter attached to the objective. And we have the main telescope, a Tech Apochromat 160 millimeter fluorite telescope. And then I have the focuser, feather touch focuser. Then I have a 80 millimeter extender. Then I have a quark chromosphere attached here, the green light, meaning it's tuned. Then I have an adapter for a Lunt 40 millimeter etalon, my double stack. Then I have a player one tilter. And then finally I have the camera. I've used multiple different kinds of cameras at the moment. I've got a player one. Saturn Square M camera. And that is the beast. I've experimented with different cameras with the IMX 432, the IMX 174, and the IMX 533. Given the F30 system, the best pixel match was either my IMX 174 or IMX 432 cameras. Subsequent testing has shown I get better results with the 174, which is a little surprising. But the 432, even though it's much more expensive, seems to give softer results. Part of the reason could be the faster frame capture of the 174. I found that my QHY53 174 and my Player One Apollo M cameras, both of which have the IMX174 sensor, performed about the same. A larger system like this is much more sensitive to seeing issues. On a day with average seeing, where my Lunt 100 MT performs superbly, I might find it difficult to sharply focus the Tech 160. First results were promising. One of the things I had taken for granted with the Lunt airspace etalons was the ease of tuning. I could turn the air pressure tuner on the 100 MT or turn the tilt tuner knob on the 40 millimeter scope and immediately see the difference on the sun. The Quark in contrast has a 10 position dial. First, you have to plug it in and wait 10 minutes after giving it power for it to warm up and get on band. Then every time you move the dial, you wait another 10 minutes. So in testing all 10 positions, in theory, it takes 100 minutes, not including any imaging time. Add to that the various tilt positions of the Lund Edelon in series, and you now have a daunting combination of test combinations. To complicate things further, given the sun's seeing, changes dynamically, it can be hard to know whether an adjustment looks different because the setting has changed or different because the seeing has momentarily changed. So finally, after many hours and many sessions and trying many combinations, including different Lunt tilt settings for each quark setting, I've pretty much identified what combination produces the best results. Of course, your mileage will vary. Here are some example images.
Again, a disclaimer, neither Lunt nor Daystar recommend or endorse this combination, and I'm not suggesting that you attempt it. I didn't need an apochromatic refractor since I was going to look at only one wavelength. I used my Tech 160 FL because I already had it. For the sun, an Acromat refractor from Skywatcher or Explorer Scientific will do just fine. The only caveat I'd suggest is ensure that you have a dual speed focuser that is robust enough to hold a long, heavy image train without introducing any tilt. Most telescope focusers are designed to hold a star diagonal and an eyepiece. In my case, I have an extender, a quark, a lunt etalon in an external adapter, a tilter, and a camera with a very long moment arm. Cheaper focusers may tilt or bend with so much weight extended so far from the focuser, which can affect your image. If you do attempt a project like this, you're of course welcome to do so, but it may not work to your satisfaction and you will have very limited support options, so know that you're on your own. But in my case, I was able to create a great 160 millimeter hydrogen alpha double stack telescope for about $3,500 plus the cost of my refractor. And of course, I can still use my Tech 160 FL as a night scope or with the Herschel wedge in white light, so I've retained a very flexible system. I hope you found this video interesting. If so, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps me out with the algorithm. I'll be happy to answer any questions or comments you post, and I've left links to all the gear I used in the notes. Thanks for watching.